fear. Luke chapter number 6, verse 47 and uh, through 49. Luke chapter number 6, verse 47 through 49. Somebody's getting killed right here in this atmosphere. Somebody's being delivered in this atmosphere. Luke 6 and 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. Verse 49, but, who, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth and on the foundation against uh, which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Brothers and sisters, I want to use for a topic this morning one word and that is unshakable. As you take your seats, to look at the person next to you and tell them nothing is going to move my rock. Nothing is going to move my rock. Nothing is going to move my rock. There is a declaration in this house this morning as God has stirred up my spirit. That there is some shifting that is happening in the heavenly realm. In this earthly realm, there are things that are going on. You may not see it now, but in the days to come, you will see that which I am talking of. Jesus gives us this parable of two houses, two foundations, and two men. There are two different houses and two different foundations and two different men. In the text that we read uh, Jesus divides the whole world into two classes of people. The first class, he said, is the wise, and the second class is the foolish. What Jesus teaches us in this text is that it is up to you whether you be wise or whether you be foolish. Because there is no one that is born with a predisposition to foolishness. There is no one also that is born with a predisposition to be wise, but it is a choice. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's a choice. Yeah, look at the person on the other side of you and tell them make the right choice. Yeah, make the right choice. Even though this teaching is a contrast and variables, one thing is the same in the text. And that there is that there is a storm. The point is that the storm comes to everybody. That, that trials and tribulations and circumstances and situations come to everybody. The storm comes and, and, and everybody, whether you are uh, in a storm or coming out of a storm or getting ready to head into a storm, everybody will deal with the storm. That being said, the only thing that is to question is not why or how or where, but when. Uh, living here in upstate New York, there is no question why the storm comes. It, it, it comes and which direction it's going to come because none of these things make a difference anyway. The question that we have to answer is when will the storm come? And the truth is that the question cannot be answered because no one can control the weather. 
At best, what we can do is we can try to predict it, but we know even in this, this week here in Rochester, the meteorologists were wrong. They didn't anticipate the storm that we have. And the same is true of life. No one knows when the storm will come. Some people in the natural have the advantage of daylight hours, and they can see the storm coming in the distance, and they're able to prepare for it. They can board up their houses and put out sandbags, and, 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 and they can prepare as best as they can. But then there are others that uh, went to bed after a summer's evening and spring evening and woke up at the sound of a tornado ripping their house apart, destroying everything that they hold dear, and they even lost spouses and children, and all that remained were the broken pieces of a life that used to be. Please understand me uh, this morning, brothers and sisters, that I'm not talking about meteorology. Uh, the used to be that I'm talking about is a home that used to be. The used to be that I'm talking about is a life that used to be beautiful, a body that used to be healthy and strong, a family that used to be close and used to love each other, a mind that used to be clear and sharp and uncluttered by anxiety, uh, from anxiety and worry and dreams and aspirations that are destroyed because of a storm. And all of this happened without warning. All of this happened suddenly. The Bible tells us, watch it, that it happened while they were asleep. I wonder how many storms could have actually been avoided had we not been sleeping. Mm. I know some storms are uh, unavoidable and there are some storms uh, that could actually be avoided and could have been uh, 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 passed us by had we not been sleeping. If we would just wake up, we could pass some storms by. There are some storms that we could avoid if we are awake. Nudge your neighbor and say, wake up. Yeah, wake up and pay attention. Wake up because we all don't have to have a mental breakdown. Yeah, we all don't have to have physical attacks that lead to heart attack and stroke and cancer and sugar diabetes and even death. A lot of things happen in our lives simply because we are asleep. We, they happen because we're not watching and we're not paying attention. But I like what 1 Thessalonians 5 and 7 says. He says, for they that sleep, sleep in the night and they be drunken, are drunken in the night. Watch me. Samson did not have to have his eyes gouged out. He did not have to suffer hum uh, humility and play the part of a fool as a slave in a Philistine prison. This storm could have been avoided, but Samson's problem is a lot of problem of the people of our day to day. He was sleeping when he should have been paying attention. Yeah, there's a lot of people even in the house of God today that we are sleeping when we should be praying. Sleeping when we should be in the word of God. Sleeping when we should be listening to the word of God being preached. But instead, we come into the house of God. We fold our legs and we text the whole time the service is going on. Or we talk and got so much to say to our neighbor the whole time that something is going on. But God is saying, if you will just wake up and pay attention to the word that I'm sending you, it will be the word that will save your very life. It will be the word that will heal you when you need to be healed and deliver you when you need to be delivered. Samson was sleeping while the storm was brewing. Samson closed his eyes to the obvious around him. What Samson did is what a lot of us do. Samson pretended like everything was all right when he knew in his heart that it was all wrong. Uh, because you cannot just be a listener of the word. You have to be a liver of the word. You can't just hear the word and come to church as a social hour. But you got to hear the word. Because hearing the word is one thing. But doing the word is where the difference is made. And I'm preaching to somebody today. You going through a storm. You in a situation or a circumstance. And I know some storms are unavoidable. But there are some storms... We we don't have to go through. 
there's some problems that we don't have to have. Some of you today are in a storm right now that you didn't have to go through. Hell that you didn't have to go through. A heartbreak that you didn't have to experience. These are storms which are the product of uh, the fruit of fleshly desires and decisions. You didn't have to have that brand new bag and those new pair of shoes when you knew your, your bills were due. Yeah, but now, now you you behind in your bills and you behind and the money is short. And now you say, oh, God bless me with a miracle. And God says, I told you what to do first. <laughs> Samson's life was a series of storms, tragedies, loss, heartbreak. And every one of them was the product of his own self-will. Actions that are birthed are the desires of his flesh. I just want to have it. I just want to do it. Uh, you can go ahead and look at me with that Bible way look, but we've all been there. No one can point a self-righteous finger at somebody else without pointing at yourself. We all have blown it when God was trying to tell us, don't go there, don't do this, don't buy that, don't listen to what I'm trying to say. We've all moved in the flesh and ignored wise counsel. I don't argue with people when they have made up in their mind that they're going to do something and they're going to live a certain way and they're going to act a certain way. I know that God is the best teacher that you could ever have. God knows how to humble you. When you don't know how to humble yourself and you keep walking around like everybody owes you something, God knows how to humble you. God knows how to get you when nobody else can get you. And Samson found himself in a storm. We are like Samson sometimes because these storms come to us sometimes when they don't have to. But it's not the storm like these that we are talking about in the text because the storm in the text that we're talking about is an unforeseeable storm. It is a storm that is supernatural in de design. It is, it is an origin that comes from the enemy. It is unavoidable. This storm is not the consequence of bad or selfish or carnal decisions. This storm is the product uh, of satanic conspiracy. Uh, can I tell you this morning that there is a devil that don't like you? Can I tell you this morning that there is a devil that will do everything he can to stop you and destroy you and defeat you? You think that the devil is your friend, the world is your friend, but the enemy is trying to set you up because his main job is to steal, kill, and destroy. Please don't get it twisted. I don't care how he looks. I don't care how he sounds. I don't care what he says. The enemy is coming to destroy. designed to destroy your faith and take you out. It is a fiery furnace that's designed to form and created for the sole purpose of destroying your life. Listen to me. Every storm that you go through is a test of your foundation's integrity. It is a test of the foundation that you have in your life. Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace was supposed to, somebody say supposed to, it was supposed to prove publicly that the faith of the three Hebrew boys was worthless. The reason why you go through the things that you go through on your job is because the enemy is trying to show your co-workers that the God that you serve and the faith that you have in him is worthless. The reason why the enemy attacks your body is because he wants everybody around you to know if it did not work for them, it's not going to work for you. It is his intention to publicly humiliate the testimony that you have. I just have a question this morning. Does anybody have a testimony of how God brought you out? Let me see your hand. I, these lights are bright. Okay, that is the reason why you suffer so much affliction. That's the reason why the enemy comes at you from every side. It's because of your testimony. 
He wants to publicly humiliate the testimony and the confession of these three children of faith, these Hebrew boys. That is the purpose of the storm. And the reason why it comes is to humiliate us and ridicule us and destroy our faith in God. I'm looking at some people that used to be on fire for God, used to teach Sunday school and teach Bible study about the faith of God. And because the storms have come, because situations didn't turn out the way that we thought they were going to turn out, some people have backed up. But I came here on assignment this morning to stir you up and to let you know that though the enemy blows, you better be unshakable because we are living in a time that everything that can be shaken is going going to be shaken and everything that will falter is going to falter but those that are built on a foundation whose name is Jesus Christ will stand through the test of time somebody shout hallelujah in this place somebody shout hallelujah in this place because the enemy he wants to put you on display so that the world could say, if they couldn't make it, neither can you. I destroyed them. I'm going to destroy you too. And the sad truth is this, that there are many in the church that have been blown away by the storms. And Jesus tells us why. He says, because their house was built on the sand. They went to church. But church wasn't in them. They sung the songs, but the songs wasn't in them. They prayed the fiery prayers, but they danced and shouted. They even paid their tithes and talked in tongues, but their house was built on the sand. The sand means it's the surface. That's moving and shifting and changing and it's unshaped, uh, unstable. So whatever is popular, I'm going to do what's popular. Uh, wh whoever I can be in uh, a connection with, eh, I'll do it in order to be good with them. But when your house is built on a solid foundation, you declare for God I live and for God I will die. Instead of the rock they built on religious affiliation. I'm a member of this church. They, they built on their good deeds and they, they built on their legal righteousness and they built on their own wisdom and their own knowledge. And all of these things are sand moving and shifting with the rising tide. In the kingdom of God. It is hearing plus doing that equals standing. Yeah, hearing plus doing. It's one thing to hear the word of God. You may even repeat what you heard somebody else say. But it's not until you do it that you will actually be established and you'll be able to stand in the midst of the storm. Now, Runder, the songwriter says, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. It is no mystery that when someone falls, regardless of how big or beautiful the house or the position is, Jesus reveals that when the house is destroyed, it is destroyed for one reason and one reason alone. It is because the foundation has a problem. God told me we got to get back to foundation yeah not, not just in the house because people want to dictate what happens in the house but what about in your house yeah how often do you pray in your house how often do you read the Bible in your house or are you a Sunday morning only Christian you become a Sunday morning Christian when you walk through the doors here at 4831 but I want to be a Christian no matter where I go I want to have that foundation in my house in the schoolhouse in the workhouse in the supermarket wherever I go I have to have the foundation 
Because everything, hear me, is dependent on your foundation. This is where so many people miss it, safe and secular. Everything is dependent on your foundation. They want to build something that they can be proud of that can impress others. So they want the big names and the big titles. They want the influence. We want everybody to clap for us and everybody to respect us and call us this name and that name. And they want to teach and sing and they want to do all of these things and they want the big houses and the fancy cars, but they don't have a strong foundation. They put all of their energy into what people can see. Uh, how do I look? Yeah, what, 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 what Christianese can I use today? But when the rubber meets the road, God says, man look what looks on the outward appearance, but I look at your heart. Yeah, and some of the hearts are wicked and deceitful and desperately wicked. God says, I'm looking at your heart. Because you can only fix the heart by fixing the foundation. Your spiritual house needs more than just good intentions. It needs some good actions. In other words, I got to hear the word and I have to act on the word. I have to apply the word. Jesus said, the wise men dug down deep and laid his foundation on the rock. The wise man understood the most necessary thing in his house was the foundation. The wise man was more concerned about what others could not see. That is why he spent so much time digging the foundation. You wouldn't be so sensitive and touchy if you did, dug deep and worked on your foundation. You, you wouldn't have all of the wicked thoughts that you have if you dug and worked on your foundation. You wouldn't treat everybody the way that they shouldn't be treated, but the Bible says they shouldn't be treated if you worked on your foundation. Ninety percent of what makes us a Christian is what people don't see. Not the ten percent of what people does do see. It's kind of like that iceberg theory. You've seen the iceberg theory where the iceberg is on, put that, put that graphic up, thank you. That graphic, the, the, the actions that we take and the things that we say, that's what people do see. You wonder why people say certain things that they say? It's because of what's underneath. You wonder why people act the way that they act? It's because of what's underneath. You cannot act like a child of God if underneath is not what God has uh, prescribed a child of God should do, say, or believe, or act. You looking at people and you wonder, even if you're looking at yourself, why can't I get it together? Why can't I do what he tells me to do? It's the foundation. Your foundation is off. iceberg 90% of what you don't see creates the 10% of what you do see and that's the same thing that happens in our spiritual walk remember Jesus Jesus spent 30 years in his life laying a foundation for three and a half years of ministry Jesus was born we saw him at uh, age 12 in the temple, but we knew nothing of his life until age 12, and we heard nothing of his life until he went into public ministry. What was Jesus doing during all of those silent years? He was building a foundation. And what we have a problem with is we have a problem with the silent years. Because we want everybody to look at us because we don't know who we are. God, help us to know who we are in you. Because my identity is not what people see on social media. My identity is not the pictures and the selfies that I take and, and, and all the things that I put online. But my identity only comes from you. You will have proper self-esteem when you know who God has called you to be. 
because we want everybody to see us, applaud for us, talk about us, we won't work on our foundation in the silent years. That's why you see people running out and getting in other people's lane that they're not supposed to be in. Jesus was teaching us how to build our lives. This is the foundational life. Then he says, when you do these things in secret, your father will reward you openly. The wise man dug down deep. The wise man was willing to invest time and effort in building a good foundation. And Jesus reveals the reason why one man's house was destroyed by the storm and the others was not but because he built his foundation on the rock. Because a firm foundation in Christ is the bedrock for a resilient life. No matter what you go through, if you have your foundation on Christ you'll go through with your head held high you might have some pains you might have some struggles but if you built on the rock you'll go through and you'll bounce back every time because watch it laying a foundation for a successful life is hard work anybody can shout when the music is good anybody can dance and run and sing when the music is good but it's hard sometimes to shout and dance and run and holler when you're digging and hitting rocks and roots and things that you got to get out of the way. And God is working on your heart and God is changing your mind and changing your attitude. You got to surrender and say, God, do what you will, but I got to have the proper foundation. The wise man dug down deep. Because you have to dig past your feelings. We live in a generation and a culture with what you feel is superior to everything else. Just because I feel it doesn't mean I have to act on it. Just because I feel it doesn't mean that it's true. But I have to dig past my emotion. I got to dig past popular opinion. I got to dig past religious pedigree and head knowledge and dig past secondhand revelation. What do I mean by secondhand revelation? In other words, you can't build your life on who everybody else says Jesus is. But you got to learn how to know him for yourself. Yeah, testify to somebody and tell them I know him for myself. Oh, it was pretty quiet. Tell somebody else, I know him for myself. Watch this. And the acid test that you really know him for yourself is revealed in your understanding that your faith isn't tested in the calm seas. But your faith is tested in the storms of life. That's the acid test of whether you really know him or not. I can sing, I can jam, dance, and I can move. Oh, yes, I know him. Got him in my hands, got him in my feet, got him all over me. But the acid test of whether I really know him is when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death that I really do fear no evil because I know he's with me all the way through it. Consistency in character is the secret to weathering life storms. Consistency in your character is the secret to weathering life's storms. Because integrity is not about just doing right. It's about being right with God. It's being in connection with God and your character is the loudest testimony that you preach. Your character, how you are when you don't think nobody's looking. Because sometimes we don't think anybody's looking but somebody really is looking. Somebody is paying attention and your character is the loudest testimony. There are storms in life that are unavoidable. 
There's some storms that take us by surprise. There are some storms that are supernatural in design and origin. But the revelation that Jesus brings through this text to us is if the house has the right foundation, it will be standing when the storm is over. Somebody in this house knows what I'm talking about. Because you're just like some, other, some others of us that we've had some storms in our life but our testimony is I'm still standing. Yeah, I, 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 you see me standing up here today and it looks like I got it all together and ain't never been through nothing, but I'm telling you right now, I've had some storms, I've had some situations, and it doesn't mean that I've never been through anything, but hear me telling you this for sure, that I went through, but I'm still standing. I don't have time to talk about it, and I don't have time to pass the mic, but I've been through some things that could have been avoided, and some things that couldn't be avoided but the message that I want to get over to you today is that I'm still standing and I wonder how many people have the same testimony and will declare it to three people I've been through the storm but I'm still standing yeah somebody went through a sickness but they still standing Somebody went through a depression, but they're still standing. Somebody went through a breakdown and break up, but they're still standing. They, somebody took a good hit, but I'm still standing. Somebody shout, I'm still standing. Oh, you didn't shout a shout, I'm still standing. I went through a bad storm, but I'm still standing. It tore some stuff up around me, but I'm still standing. I lost some stuff that I thought I could never have without, but I'm still standing. Somebody said it blew some people away that I thought would always be here, but I'm still standing. Sometimes... We can go through the storm and it feels like the storm will never end. But I'm still standing. And I hear you saying, Pastor, I hear you, I hear you saying that, that the, the storm will pass and that you have to build the foundation. I, I hear all of that, but how do you make it? How do you survive when others didn't make it? How do you get through the storm of sickness and the storm of loss and the storm of broken relationship and heartbreak and financial disaster? How do you make it when everything you love and hold dear is taken away from you and so many people have given up, caved in and quit? How do you make it through the secret is brothers and sisters you gotta find the rock you gotta dig past everything and everybody else dig past church and religion and emotions and feelings and opinions and you gotta hit the rock you gotta keep digging until you hit the rock and once you hit the rock that foundation that life will not roll away with the storms when you have your foundation built on Christ Let me tell you this, you might have been in here and you might have had the weather and the storms beat on you, pounding on your life like there was no tomorrow. You might be hearing the thunder roar and seeing the flashing lights. Somebody in here got some bad news and the, the threat of fear tried to grip your heart. But hear me when I say it this morning. Keep digging until you hit the rock. Keep digging until you hit the rock. When I feel the rock up under my feet, I know I'm safe. When I feel the rock up under my feet, I know I'm going to make it because nothing can move my rock. David says it. He says nothing will be able to move my rock. He said the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He only is my rock and my salvation is my defense. I shall not be moved. Look at somebody and tell them nothing's going to move my rock. He says it. He says it in Psalm 40 and 2. He says, he brought me up also. 
out of a horrible pit out of the miry clay and has set my feet on a rock and established my going say it again nothing's going to move my rock what David was saying to us that it doesn't matter what comes in your life you are going to make it because nothing can move your rock the difference between the people that are still standing and stable when they go through and the people that lose it Give up, cave in, quit, regress. Stop going to church. Oh, I'm not going tonight. I, I don't feel like praising. I, I don't feel like worshiping. I'm going to come and drop my body off. That's the time when you should be digging. Saying, God, I don't know what's happening, but I'm digging because I got to find the rock. I'm digging because I know if nobody can keep me safe, you can keep me safe. If my footings don't fall on nothing else, I'm going to be established on your rock. He says, no matter what comes, you can stand because nothing's going to remove your rock. And somebody in here today listening to this message, you are in a storm. Somebody's getting ready to go into a storm. Somebody's on the way out of a storm. And we're not concerned today of whether or not it was avoidable. Whether you caused it or it was satanic in nature. We're not asking you any of those questions. Because building on Christ is not just about avoiding the fall, but it's about standing tall when the storm comes. The point is, you're in a season where stuff is shaking all around you and you need help. And the help that you need, you need it right now. Everything that you've been holding on to is about to be shaken. But I hear David say when, not if, but when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And I came, brothers and sisters, this morning to lead you to a rock that is higher than you. The rock that's higher than your storm and higher than the fight that you're in. The rock that is higher than the fire that you might be going through. Higher than the enemy that's bringing it your way. That's warring against you. I don't want to hold you too long, but I got to tell you about this rock for a minute. Because in Exodus chapter number 17, water came out of the rock and quenched the thirst between one to three million Israelites. In Judges chapter number 6, fire came up out of the rock and consumed Gideon's offering. In Job 29 and 6, the rock poured out rivers of oil. In Psalms 81 and 16, he said, I will satisfy with honey from the rock in first corinthians chapter number 10 it says that the rock that flowed from the children of israel all through the wilderness and they're wandering and then it says that that rock was jesus christ that's the rock that i'm talking about when you dig and get to that rock you're saying jesus i can't make it without you it's the same rock that jesus says upon this rock i'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it somebody put your hands together open your mouth and thank god for jesus who is that rock Testify to two people and say, Jesus is my rock. Yeah, tell them, Jesus is my rock. He's the rock that never rolls. He's the rock that never shifts its foundation. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He is the captain that's never lost a battle. He is the shelter in the time of storm. He is the fortress and my high tower. Jesus is my rock. Everything in this world is going to be shaken. Things are shaken on the world stage right now. 
The wind and the rain may be beating against your life and it looks like nothing or no one you can depend on. But I came to remind you this morning that you can depend on Jesus. That if you don't have anything else, if you step on the rock, you'll make it. I can't promise you that the storm is going to stop. But I can promise you one thing. If you stand on the rock, when the storm blows and the wind blows and the rain blows, you'll still be standing when all is over. Hear me this morning. Hear me this morning. This has been branded in my spirit because the world government is shaking. The world's economy is shaking. And the church has become comfortable in going to church. Because it's what we do. When God's saying that you're supposed to be the salt of the earth. You're supposed to be making a difference in your respective areas and communities. Everybody not supposed to stand behind this podium. But God has made you the preacher and the priest of the area that you are in. Whether you are in banking or real estate or education or entertainment, you are supposed to be the priest. Nursing, medical field, you're supposed to be the one that makes a difference in that community. The religious world is shaking. People that used to believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism have changed their mind about who God is. But I came to tell you this morning, there is no confusion in my mind. There is only one Lord and one faith and one baptism, and his name is Jesus Christ. family structure is changing and now Christians have become acceptable of everything we have become acceptable of anything and everything God says that you have to put a difference between that which is clean and that is unclean that which is right and that which is not right he said, you can't just accept any and everything. He said, you got to take a stand. Because if you don't stand on the rock when the winds blow, and you're going to see a lot of people that have not built on the rock, but built on the stand. They built their name and their following and their influence on the sand. When the wind blows, they will not be standing. Everything around us is shaking except for the rock. Tell your neighbor, you're going to make it. If you make it to the rock. If your foundation is built on the rock, come hell or high water, you're going to make it. Because you made it to the rock, nothing will move your rock. If you're building on this world's system, you're going to fail. If you're building on this world's economy system, you're going to fail. I don't care what people tell you. God says, I've already planned that the wealth of this world is going to be transferred into the people's hands that are going to fund my kingdom. So I don't care how much money anybody makes. As long as I build my house on the rock, God's going to make sure that I'm going to fund his gospel. If you're building, waiting for the next president to save you, you're going to fail. If you're counting on playing the stock market to try to win, you're going to crash. There's only one thing that you can depend on in this world today. There's only one foundation that is sure that will not be moved. And it is the rock of ages. And his name is Jesus Christ.
Stand with me all over this building. If you build on any other foundation, the Bible calls you a fool. I'm not saying that the fool, you're a fool, but the Bible calls you a fool. I'm repeating what the Bible says. If you build on any other foundation other than the rock, he said, it's foolish. Today, I want to lead you to the rock whose name is Jesus. Jesus.